Thanks, Shiva. So it's a special pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, what I do and what I've been doing over the past couple of decades. As you can see, I work on animal acoustic communication. And I'm basically interested in many different aspects of how animals communicate with each other and the signals that they produced, including the structures of signals themselves, how diverse they are, why they're different from each other, how signals are perceived, what animals make signals for, and the ecological and evolutionary context in which signals have evolved. Okay? And uh, well, I'm going to have to stand near the computer a bit because I have to play you uh, calls. Um, since this is a workshop entirely for women students, I thought in this talk, I will highlight uh, the work of my many, many women students and postdocs. I've also had men students and postdocs, almost an equal number. But in this talk, I will highlight uh, the contributions of the women students and postdocs who've gone through my lab over the years. And as you can see from this picture, they've done a fairly stiff amount of fieldwork between them. And I must tell you that all the projects that required fieldwork under very trying and dangerous circumstances were all done by the women in, uh, in my lab, not by the men. OK. Um, so yes, I'm from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, which you may have seen uh, the campus. And when I started out, I study crickets. The crickets are these little black brown kind of insects, the true crickets, that you can see everywhere. You can see them. I'm sure you have them out here in your lawns. You have them in fields. You have them in jungles. You have them in deserts. In the evening when the sun goes down, and today when the sun goes down, listen, you may hear crickets calling. And what I'm going to tell you today is largely going to be about cricket songs and what we do with cricket songs. So the first thing is, why do you hear all this calling out there? All of this noise that you hear out there in the evening is made by male crickets. And each male cricket is singing away, trying to attract a female of his species. Females don't sing. They're mute. So you can see over here, there's a male cricket standing near his burrow singing. This is a painting from the 1700s. And here's a female approaching him. How do I know she's a female? She has this ovipositor to put eggs into the soil, which males lack. So you can recognize females from males. And how do we know that this singing attracts females? So a very long time ago, 60, 70 years ago, actually, people made recordings of these signals. They put them out in the field and played them out through loudspeakers. You don't see loudspeakers like this anymore. But, um, you can see that a lot of crickets have come towards it. And these are female crickets. And if you look carefully, they'll be all the same species. OK? Right. So one of my first students from 20 years ago, Natasha Matre, started recording the cricket species that were there on our campus. And three cricket species who share the same patch of lawn on the campus. So I'm going to try and play you those calls. For that, I have to yeah get off this view. Um, so here's the first one. It's a very familiar call. Note that they're very discontinuous, right? So here's the second one. Can you hear the difference? It sounds different, right? And here's the third. OK? So to our ears, they do sound different. But if we go in a little bit and ask, why are they sounding different? Well, let me put this back on. Yeah. If we go back and ask, well, what is it about these calls that make them sound different? If you make recordings of this, and you can make recordings of this with a simple microphone and a tape recorder, or today even on your cell phone, okay? You can actually visualize them, okay? 
And if you visualize these signals, you can see the first one that you heard. It's got this very discontinuous chirpy structure. But you can see that these chirps themselves are made up of smaller units or syllables. That's because these animals produce sound by rubbing the wings together. And each time they close the wing, you get sound. When they open the wing, it's silent. Okay? So each of these little syllables corresponds to a wing closure. Sorry, I should tell you what this is. There's time on this axis, and there is the amplitude of the signal, in this case, the sound signal. Okay? So there are these pulse sound signals. All three are chirping species, as you heard, right? They're pre, 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 pre. They have a fine structure within them, but what's different between them is the rate at which these different syllables are produced, as well as the rate at which these chirps are produced. If you had listened very carefully, you would have realized that the first two actually were more similar in pitch. The second one sounded different, right? And you can see that in these power spectra. I think as math and stats students, I probably don't have to explain what it is. But basically, you can decompose any signal into its constituent frequencies and examine that on a frequency spectrum. So you've got frequency on this axis and relative amplitude of the sound energy on the y-axis. And for the first call, uh, the, the first thing to notice is in all of them, you've got these sharp peaks. So most of the energy is concentrated in a very narrow frequency band. In this case, around 5 kilohertz is also very close. But you can see the third species is around 7 kilohertz, which is why it sounded different. Okay? So the reason that sounds sound different is because of the rhythm pattern in time, and because of the frequencies or the pitch. Okay? So they sound different to us, but can the females tell the difference? So I should back up a little bit that each of these species actually has a specific song. So this is a song of one species, this is a song of another species, and this is a song of a third species, right? So one of the first experiments that Natasha did was to ask whether females actually can also tell the difference, right? So a female of this species should go towards the call of a male of this species and not go to the call of this one because it's a waste for her to go to the wrong male. But out there in the lawn, they're all singing together, right? So it's useful to discriminate these songs. Can they do it? So the way that we studied that, we made a sound recording of the different species. We took the call of one of the species. We placed a loudspeaker in a little pit. These are animals that live on the ground. In the field, we dug a little pit. And we put a loudspeaker in here, and we played out this call. We released a female a meter away and just followed her, watched what she did. And here is the walking track of that female. You can see she walks, and she will jump into this. Here is the walking track of another female, and she jumps into this, right? Now, if you replace the song of her own species with the song of another species, then you see something different. You see that this female has actually walked away. Okay? They don't go towards the song that's playing, even though it's played at the same loudness and the sound the song of the second species is actually at the same pitch, so they really should be able to hear it just as well. Okay? So this tells us that indeed these crickets can also tell differences between their songs, um, not based on the pitch, because these two songs are the same pitch, but just based on the rhythm parameters, the chirp and syllable rates. So you can do experiments like this to try and figure out how females can tell one song apart from another. But the problem gets worse because if you think about it, in a natural environment, you've got multiple males all calling together. You've got males of different species, and you have males of the same species. Some are louder than others, some sing longer than others, some may be closer to a female than others. So how do you manage, if there are multiple singers singing around you, to actually locate one male among many simultaneously calling males. Okay? This is a problem. It's, it's a fairly non-trivial problem. 
It's called the cocktail party problem, and the reason it's called the cocktail party problem is obvious. So if you're at a cocktail party or any kind of party, and everybody is talking very, very loudly, and you want to listen to you know, one person's conversation, then you have to somehow extract that one person's conversation pattern from this loud background. And this is the same kind of problem. You've got lots of crickets singing around you, and I want to listen in and move towards one particular male. So the first thing we ask, so if it is people, you can ask them, you know, is it a problem? What are you listening to? But how do we know whether crickets experience cocktail parties or cocktail party problems, right? So you have to do it relatively um, uh, in a roundabout way because you have to get the answers out of the animals, right? So I have to figure out whether a female standing out there in the field actually can hear multiple different males. If she can't, then there's no problem, right? Okay, so that's the first question we ask. But how do you ask that question, right? What she hears is a function of many different things, right? It's a function of where males are with respect to each other, which is what we've shown you over here. So each of this is the actual position of a calling male that was tracked in the field, okay? So these are the guys who are all calling, okay? And what we find is that the males don't move very much in a night. That would complicate life even more if they did. But luckily for us, during a night, they like to sit in one particular spot. So these choruses are quite stable in a night. Okay? And they're calling out, but the question now is, how loud are they? And why is that important? It's important because if you're louder, then your signal will travel further. Okay? How do we measure that? What we do is we creep up to a singing male with a sound level meter, something that measures loudness, placed on the ground, okay? Go very close to it, about 10 centimeters away, measure the sound pressure level, and then slowly keep moving away and see how that decreases. And here, you can see the decrease in that sound pressure level with distance along the ground, and you have to do it along the ground because female crickets are on the ground. Okay? And you look at how that sound attenuates with distance. Okay? So now you know how the sound from each male actually attenuates as you walk away from it. The third piece of information that you need to figure out whether females can hear males is something about the hearing sensitivity, right? Because whether I can hear a male from 200 centimeters or 100 centimeters, but 100 centimeters is at 40 decibels depends upon how sensitive my ears are, okay? So you can work that out in an independent experiment in the lab, again a behavioral experiment. What you do, you bring a female and you have a loudspeaker and you play a male call, but you play it first very, very soft. If she can't hear it, she won't respond to it. So then you keep slowly raising the volume until such time as you reliably get responses from many, many females, and that's the average hearing threshold, right? Ours is about, we call it zero dB SPL. Our ears are quite sensitive, okay? A cricket's ears are typically set between 35 and 40. So from this graph then, you can compute on average from how far away a female cricket will hear a male, okay? And that's the basis of these circles that we have drawn here. So these circles give you the average distance at which uh, a female will hear a male who's standing and calling at this point, okay? What does this mean? It means if the circles intersect a lot, then a female at this point is going to be hearing both of these males. A female at this point is going to be hearing multiple males, right? So you can do this exercise over and over again with multiple choruses in the field, and then you can figure out how often this has happened. And this happens about 60 to 65% of the time, which means, yes, significantly, there can be dense choruses, and there is the possibility that they're listening to multiple males. So the problem exists, right? It's a good question to ask, because sometimes you go after problems that actually are not problems, okay? Um, yeah. So then we want to ask, can they solve this problem? So they're hearing multiple males, right? So now we have four speakers over here, and all four of them are playing out the same call um, 
So it's like four different males are calling from here. There's a little female placed in the center. And I'm going to play you this video so you can see. Uh, four speakers are playing at the same time, she's able to home in and reliably locate one speaker. And if you do this again and again and again, you do this experiment again and again and again with many, many, many females, then you can see each of these is the walking track of one female. And you can see that if you place them in this position, many of them end up here, few of them end up there, few here, and very few here at the back. But the fact is almost everybody gets to some male, even though all the calls are playing together. Okay. And the reason that this is a non-trivial exercise is because of the nature of sound. Okay? If you think about it, when you hear a sound, you can automatically say, hey, it's coming from here. Okay? Why is it that you're actually able to locate that sound? If you think about it, sound is a scalar, right? It doesn't have location information in it. Your ear is just a membrane that vibrates. Okay? So there really isn't inherent information about directionality. What we do is we actually use our two ears. Okay? So the sound comes from out there, it hits this ear first, goes from the head, and then hits this ear. So there's a tiny time difference between when it hits this and hits this. Okay? And that's what our brains compute. Okay? So we Compute these time differences. Coming in front, both come at the same time, zero time difference. Coming from the side, max time difference. In between, there'll be an in-between time difference. And if we can compute these time differences, we can compute where a sound is coming from. Okay? Um, it becomes more difficult when there are multiple sources, right? Because then you're getting all these sources interfering with each other. Okay? And for these animals, it's even harder because they're very small. Okay? They're so small and their ears are on their legs. Okay? So they're very, very small, their ears are on their legs, these time delays are really, really tiny, and they're very tiny brains. Okay? So it's not a problem that is trivial to solve. Okay? Um, but we want to ask whether we understand enough about their hearing system that we can actually predict these behaviors that we see when we do these experiments. So what my student Natasha did was to create virtual females. Okay, basically she modeled the hearing of these animals. She modeled the acoustic environment because we know that, we had measured it right, we know where males are, how loudly they call, how the sound attenuates. So for any position that you put a receiver in, we'll be able to tell you how loud each of those signals are, okay? We know something about the hearing sensitivity, and we know something about the neural mechanisms of how they represent sound, okay? This is known from earlier work, from physiology. We know that they will represent in their nervous systems the sound that's loudest at once on that side. So if you've got your auditory system on two sides, then if the sound is coming from this side, then it will more stimulate the auditory system on this side than on that side. Okay? That's how we represent that difference. So we understand that, so we can model all of that. If the sound is coming from here and it sounds louder this year, then you will tend to turn towards that side. Okay? So we use this very simple model. And then you replot after the female has moved a little bit, Everything changes, right? Because now she has moved. So then you recalculate what all she can hear, what all she represents, now where will she go? Will she turn? But there's also a lot of stochasticity. You know, animals are not robots, so they may turn sometimes by 50 degrees sometimes. So you factor in all that, 
and you build a stochastic model, and then you ask whether you can replicate these parts. And what we find is that using whatever we understand about the physiology, we actually can replicate such parts. So in a simulation in which we have a similar situation of four speakers, we can, at least at the population level, we can recreate these kinds of path structures. What, why do an exercise like this? We do exercises like this because it allows us to ask whether what we think we understand about how an animal does something is valid. If we think we understand it, so I understand the ear, I understand the hearing, I understand a little bit about how things are wired up, okay, then if I put all of this together in a model, my model should be able to accurately represent the behavior, okay? And that is the reason why biologists, uh, certainly neurobiologists and people who do behavior, uh, like to do simulations and like to do robotics. For us, it is what we call a test of sufficiency. So is what we have understood sufficient to explain the behavior? Doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the animal works, because animals can be more complicated. But at least the rules we have understood are enough for us to predict the behavior, OK? So you can, from an understanding of hearing, of physiology, and of the acoustics of the system, at least in simpler systems such as this, actually predict which way animals will move, OK, in an environment, which also tells us that we have some understanding of the solution to this problem of finding one source, one male among many, OK? OK. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Natasha. So Natasha, after completing her PhD, uh, doing this wonderful stuff about predicting acoustic orientation in these complex environments, then moved on for her postdoc to looking at the mechanics of both sound production and hearing. So here's a tree cricket who's singing by moving his wings together. And she did some work asking why they produce the frequencies that they do and why these change when you change temperature, which is a, which is a characteristic of tree crickets. She did some work looking at the ears of crickets. And she's also a very enthusiastic snake catcher. And she's currently gone on now to be assistant professor in Canada. She's also a brilliant photographer. And she came out with this book at the centenary of IISC called Secret Lives, where she had photographed a number of birds and insects and plants on campus okay, and stories about them. So she's Certainly, very talented person and has gone on now to continue with biomechanics. Okay. I'll move on now to a slightly different kind of problem, but again talking about multiple signalers and receivers. So basically, you've got in communication, you have a signaler who produces a signal, usually to some intended receiver. In this case, it's male of the species trying to attract female of the species. The signal has a very uh, specific structure depending upon the species, but it's put into this common medium, right? It's put out into air. So actually, it's very analogous to your cell phone uh, networks, because from your cell phone, you want to talk to one particular person, and you want to send this very private message. But you actually have to put it out into this very public medium, right? You have to send it out into the air. And so it can, so there are a lot of signals. Think about it. All your phone messages are going up and down all over, right? You know, transmitting them. So same thing in acoustic communities. Everyone's like singing out loud. And all the messages are there for everybody to see in some sense if you know how to intercept them. And the medium through which it goes does things to the signal, right? So if you have a lot of trees and you have ground and you have a signal that looks neat and clean, after it's gone through the medium, can look a little ugly and distorted, and you still have to figure out, recognize it. But worse, you can have masking, right? Everybody's calling all together. So many different species are also calling all together. So how do you unscramble? How do you deal with this problem of extracting one particular message or conveying one particular message when everybody's putting out multiple messages into the environment? So what kind of strategies? 
can one use? What kind of strategies do animals use? Okay. So this is just to give you a feel for what a forest sounds like at night. Mm. So if you walk into a forest at dusk, that's what you hear. You know, you hear this loud chorus of insects, and you wonder how anybody figures out anything. How might animals solve this problem, right? Well, first look at it from the point of view of the senders. What kind of strategies can you use so that you avoid interfering your signals with each other? So you can think of different ways. You can think of partitioning your signals in time. So if you have species one, species two, species three, maybe they can breed, this I'm giving you an extreme example, you can breed in slightly non-overlapping parts of the year or month. Or you breed at the same time and you call in the same season, but you can call at different times of the day or night. So if there are very similar calls, species one can call, let's say, from eight to nine, and species two can call from nine to 10, but it's not like they have a conversation about this. Or they call at the same period of the night, but you can, you can space out at a much finer, you know, for two minutes one of them calls and then in another gap for three minutes somebody else calls, right? So you can put your signals in the silent gaps. So that's the axis of time. The other way you can partition, of course, is the axis of space. As you know, sound attenuates as you go away. So if signalers space themselves apart, then they can avoid interference and they can space themselves in vertical space or horizontal space. And interestingly, they may also partition in acoustic space. So what is this? This is a spectrogram. It's just a recording I made in the forest. You know, you just put a mic out there. And then you make a spectrogram of whatever comes out. And what's a spectrogram? It shows you the components of sound with time on this axis, frequency on this axis. And can you see all these neat patterns, right? So this is one species, this is a second species, this is a third species, this is a fourth species, fifth species. There are some that are very, very mixed up. There are multiple species and multiple individuals there. But there are certainly some species that partition out very neatly into these different frequency bands. So just like radio frequency bands, where you have each band with a different kind of information to which you can tune in, in principle, and you can see the signals can be partitioned that way. And the questions um, we want to ask is, is all of this going on? But it's easier said than done because you need to find out a lot of stuff, right? You need to find out who are all the singers, who are all the senders, what do all the signals look like? When are all of these signals made with respect to each other? Where are they made from, okay? And what do the structures look like? So to do this, and we, and we were very, very ambitious, my, again, one of my first and most courageous students, Swati, more about that, uh, we decided to do it in the rainforest. Okay, so Kudremuk National Park is west of here, close to the coast. You can see what the terrain looks like, dense forest, hilly terrain. Working at night, not easy. That's what it looks like on a moonlit night. That's what it looks like on a moonless night. Okay, <laughs> you can't see anything at all. And Swati had to work in this kind of environment. Um, in her first season, she was bitten by a viper yeah, which was not fun for anybody, but she survived that and she went back. Uh, you have to look out for elephants, not very high densities, but they're out there. You have to look out for bureaucrats who won't give you permits or who won't let you go in. And there are naxals. So <laughs> it's not exactly the kind of situation in which you would want to do a PhD, but Swati was Swati and she insisted on doing that. And what did she find? After three years of going after insect after insect, call after call, making recordings, catching the animals, which most people told us was impossible to do, well, we figured out most of the insects in these patch of forest that make sounds. And we found 20 species that actually call together. Um, they're all crickets, but they come from two major groups of crickets, 10 species in one group, the true crickets, nine in another, and a third in a third group of cricket. And I'm just for fun going to play you some of these 
calls. So here's one who likes to live only on dead logs. That's a very um, hum harmonious kind of signal, melodic signal. This is a bush cricket who lives on the ground and it's a very different kind of call, right? It's very harsh and the reason it's so harsh is because it's very noisy. If you look at the spectrum over there, it's got energy all over the place. This is an understory, very nice, very melodious call. This is a false leaf catered. It looks like a leaf. It's in the understory. It's about 10 to 12 kilohertz. That's why it sounds a little uh, strange. This is an animal, again, a false leaf. It looks like a leaf. It lives high up in the canopy. And I'm going to... Okay, this last one didn't play off the speaker, unfortunately. Let me see if it's oh, playing. Yeah. Can you hear the cut? Cut. Can you hear the caps? Yeah, that's the call. To and these are very interesting. These are among the largest insects on Earth, actually. The waiters. And they're mostly found in New Zealand. But we do have one or two representatives um, over here. And we were able to find these. They're also canopy dwellers and also record their calls for the first time. So this was very, very exciting. OK, so what did we do with all this? We had to answer our questions. So the first thing we tried to ask was to look at how these different species call around the clock, right? So Swati would sample, walk through the forest, and count how many individuals of each species were calling, OK? in five-minute intervals, and she did this in three-hour periods around the clock, OK? And I'm not going to go in detail into this, but what we found at the end of this was actually we have a dust course that comes up, but we didn't find any evidence that different species actually called at different times, OK? So you were equally likely to hear any of them calling within that period going from about 7 p.m. to about midnight or 1 or 2, 2 a.m., OK? So everybody likes to call during that time. And at that scale, we didn't find any evidence. But we did find evidence for several of the species calling in different frequency bands. Not all of them, but several. So it seems that the partition on the spectral in spectral space, but not at the level of calling at different times. Um, then we asked whether they actually partition in space, in vertical space. And the way we could do that is simply you look at each of the species, you look at calling individuals, and you ask how high they are from the ground. Right? So you've got animals that call only from the ground, just above the ground, a little in the bushes, and further up, and these are the tree canopy animals. And you can see that each species does have a distinct domain okay, in which it calls from in vertical space. But that's not good enough. Remember what I told you when we were looking at the field crickets? What really matters is how far out the sound goes, right? Just because two animals are calling, let's say, five meters apart, doesn't mean they can't hear each other. It depends on what the call's like, how loud it is, how it goes out. So that's what we then went in to measure. So basically, for each individual, individual of species A, individual male of species B, how loudly are they calling? Each of their calls, how do they traverse out, is what you need to find out, right? Until they hit hearing sensitivity. Right? And we assume a hearing sensitivity of about 35, which is good assumption. Okay. And that's how you can draw these circles. But now we have 3D circles. Right? So we have to look at all of these. And to do that, you have to do, again, a lot of work. So Manjari Jain, my next PhD student, 
did her PhD looking at forest acoustics and signal transmission. So basically her entire PhD was in asking what happens to these calls. What do forest structures do to calls, forest acoustics? And to do that, what she had to do was to take each of these calls and she had to rig up some fancy ways of getting up from, from, from the ground to the canopy. And from each of these little platforms, she would play out signals, re-record them, and see what happened to them. And when you do that, you can get graphs like this. So this tells you for the call of one particular species, if you play it out at 72 and you keep moving away from it at the same level, you can see that the sound pressure level keeps dropping with distance. Each of these lines gives you a different height at which you're doing the experiment. You can see this is the ground, that the ground is positively the worst place to be. It's the same for this species. No matter which species you pick, the ground is always the worst place, and any acoustician could tell you that, okay, but we just tested it empirically. So the ground is the worst place, but there are a lot of species that call from the ground, huh? okay? So what that tells you is that the ground might be a very bad place acoustically, and yet there are species that call from the ground. So there must be other things that drive why these species are calling from the ground. Maybe they want to partition out from species that are calling higher, right? Or maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's predation, right? That if they call from the ground, they can call from the mouth of burrows, they can get away, okay? We don't know, but certainly uh, the ground is not a good place to call from. But you can use these data now to actually generate the 3D versions of the circles I showed you with the field crickets. So each of these centers of these spheres is the position of a calling male, okay, of one species, and you can figure out how far each of their signals goes. And the reason each sphere is different is now we're dealing with multiple species and they're calling at different loudnesses. And that can finally give you the answer if I have a female of species X over here, how many of her neighbors of different species can she actually hear? Okay, and is she being masked, right? Because if she's standing over here, she can hear three, four, five, whatever males. And basically, we now had the data to ask those questions. And when we actually did that exercise, which is a fairly long exercise, when you actually take all these axes of separation into account, the median masking probability, what that means is, 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 is on average, the median value, okay, of the probability of masking computed as the intersections of these spheres was zero, was, or very close to zero. What does that tell you? It means the cacophony for us is actually close to silence for them, okay? So there really isn't that much loud sound out there when you're listening through the ears of the correct receiver, right? It sounds like a cacophony to us. But if I'm a little insect that, I, that can hear these certain frequencies, and I'm calling at certain loudness, okay? And you actually compute all of that, it's not all that bad, okay? So the interference problem sort of disappears, right? What we don't know <laughs> is whether we're looking at the solution to a problem, and this is the problem in biology, right? You're dealing with systems that have evolved over time. Right? So today there may be very little interference, but maybe in the past, and here I mean evolutionary past, there was. But the structures have changed and the positions that animals occupy have changed to the point where today there is no interference, right? So we don't have an answer to that. What, what we've measured is what does it look like today? How do you answer a question like that? How do you answer a question has this actually evolved to reduce interference? It's not easy to answer. One way that one can do it, even though we haven't yet, is through simulations. So if I were to simulate random communities, random acoustic communities, with all kinds of signals, and then compute all of this over and over again, then I could ask whether this particular community that I'm seeing, right, is something that is not expected by chance, okay? So that's one way to try and answer questions like this. Okay. 
Swati, after completing her very uh, hair-raising PhD, I would say, looking and, and still one of the most incredible PhDs, having actually looked at an entire forest and looking at the entire acoustic community, now continues to study acoustic signals of uh, crickets, including in Northeast India, and she's working at uh, Department of Environmental Studies in Delhi University. And Manjuri uh, also continues to study acoustic signaling and the evolution of signals, and she's now at Aisha Mahali as an assistant professor. Okay. And it was a very happy time for me two years ago at the Bioacoustics Congress to see both of my former students, now professors, okay, uh, and continuing work on bioacoustics with their students. Okay. Um, so moving on to the problems of interference, we move from what signalers can do to do receivers have mechanisms to deal with interference, right? So if you are in noisy conditions, do you have something in your ears or in the way that your auditory system works, right? That allows you to filter out noise, okay? So we're now looking at it from the other side. I'll give you one example of that. Let's take, and this work was done by my postdoc, Kaveri Rajaraman. So let's take this nice canopy catered it. And their ears, as I told you, are on their legs. Here's a close-up of the ear. This thing that you see here, these are the eardrums on one of the ears. That's what vibrates, OK? So I don't know if you remember your school um, stuff about ears. Ears are basically membranes that vibrate, right? Sound itself is a, is a vibration. And ears just uh, are set into vibration by sound. So I'm going to show you, it's actually possible now with fancy micro CTs to look inside an animal and to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure. Let me show you, because I always find this very exciting, um, what the 3D structure of a cricket ear looks like. So as this movie uh, plays, you'll see the outside being stripped away, and this is the two ears, okay? You can see this is a set of tubes, okay, with a membrane at one end. And that's the hearing organ of this cricket. Why is this interesting to us? This animal lives in the forest. It produces a call which is close to three kilohertz. And what we want to ask is, does it have any mechanism for filtering the sound? So let me back up. How do you do that? You bring in an animal into the lab. You immobilize it so it can you know, walk around. Okay? And then you just play sounds to it. You play sounds to the ear, and then you have an instrument called a laser vibrometer, which uses a laser to sense the vibrations of the eardrum, okay? So the laser vibrometer allows you to measure this up and down displacement of the eardrum, or in fact of anything, as it vibrates, got it? So what you now do is to play sounds of different frequencies at this ear and ask, what do those vibra ear vibrations look like? And what you see, when you look at this graph, here are the frequencies of sounds that we are playing. Here's 5 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz, number of other frequencies. This tells you how much the membrane is vibrating up and down. Four different frequencies played at the same sound level, loudness. And you can see that it's vibrating quite a bit below about 4 kilohertz. After 4 kilohertz, it, it sharply dips. Okay. What this means is it's acting as a low-pass filter. Okay. So it's reacting a lot to sounds that are below 4 kilohertz. And it's insensitive to sounds that are above that. Does that make sense? Let's look back at the spectrogram of the forest. Here is the call of our cricket of interest. And you will see that much of the noise is in frequencies above it. So by having an ear like this, it's actually nicely designed to be relatively deaf to sounds that are not of interest, okay? So that's a pretty neat way to filter out noise, and it's a mechanical way. Right. So the males are calling, and typically for most crickets, a female will then walk towards the male, like I told you, right? 
But in this species, something interesting happens. So if you have, you place it on a tree, tree branch in the shape of a T, and you play out the call of this animal, and I have placed the female over here, and I'm going to show you a movie. out a vibrational signal, okay? And you can measure that again using a laser vibrometer. So here's the male signal, okay? And here is the female's vibrational signal. So this is an acoustic vibratory duet. So the male calls and the female replies, but she's not replying using sound. She's replying using vibration. And each female, what this phase diagram shows you is that each female has a very typical time point after the end of the male's call when she will reply. So each of these lines is one female, and these vectors are very long and they're tight, and um, this tells you that they have a very tight timing relationship, which means it's a real duet. You only call it a duet if it's so, okay? So you've got an acoustic vibratory duet, and what we went on to show is that the males can sense these vibrations and they use these vibrations coming through the tree to locate the female, okay? So they use the vibration to find the female in these animals. So Kaveri continues to study the physiology of sound and many other things, and she's currently teaching at Ashoka University, just, just next to Delhi. I think I'm running out of time, but I'll very briefly tell you a little bit about some other stuff that my student Samira uh, Agnihotri for a change moving to birds. Um, she worked on vocal mimicry in this fantastic bird called the racket-tailed rongo. How many of you know about this bird? How many of you have ever seen this bird? Yeah. These are, they have these nice, lovely long rackets, but what makes them special is that they mimic. And they mimic other birds, they mimic also other animals. And um, she did a study in the Biligiri Rangan Hills in uh, south of here. Let me give you some examples. So here is a brown cheek fulvetta, it's a kind of a babbler. Okay, that's what it's called. I'll play it again. Here's a drongo mimicking it. It's hard to tell the difference, huh? So here is a fairy bluebird call. Rongo mimicking it. Here's a woodpecker. The rongo. And, oh, I should give you the last one. So here's a bonnet macaque call. And that's the drongo mimicking it. Okay. They're very good mimics. And we find we found, at least in our recordings, uh, 35 bird species, three mammals, two frogs, maybe an insect, that these birds were mimicking. And of course, the question one asks is, why on earth are they mimicking? And this is the question she tried to answer. And she tried to answer this using playback experiments. So you take some of these mimicked calls and you play them back and you look at what kinds of responses you get. Do you get responses from birds of the same species? Do you get responses from the species they are mimicking? Okay? And so there are sort of different kinds of syntax in these mimicry. So basically these drongos can make either very repetitive notes or they can make notes that are very different from each other in sequence. I don't have time, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what we found really was 
so I haven't told you this. Okay, that when you play these kinds of calls out, which are very repetitive, you get responses from other drongos. And when you play these kinds of calls, which are very non-repetitive, mimicking different species, like the woodpecker and the fulvetta, incredibly, you will attract woodpeckers and fulvettas. And why should drongos do this? Because they feed in what are called mixed species flocks. Okay, so you find these flocks that consist of multiple species of birds, including drongos. And basically, these birds, you know, some of them are like foraging on the floor and they disturb insects on which the drongos might be able to feed. And sometimes they will harass other birds and take away insects from them. Okay, so it's advantageous for them to be in these flocks and they seem to have learned to call them. Okay, and so they call in the language of these birds, and these birds actually uh, come, okay, um, which was interesting. I'm going to end. So Samira continues her work uh, in BRT, and she produced this fantastic uh, CD uh, on the birds of the Biligiri Rangaswamy Temple. Uh, it's a CD which we should really put online of the songs of more than 100 species of birds. We have a lot of mimicry calls that we would like to do that. I'll end very quickly with telling you a little bit about elephants. Um, there's been very, very little work done on Indian elephants, there's a huge amount of work done on African elephants, and we knew very little about what kinds of calls are used by Indian elephants, forest elephants to communicate. So Smitha Nair was the person who actually, the very brave soul who went out to try and figure out elephant acoustic rep repertoires. Okay, I'm going to show you the four major kinds of calls. Uh, this we are very... <coughs> but elephants have other interesting kinds of calls. So here there are roars. Okay, that doesn't sound... You wouldn't associate with an elephant, okay? And this is the strangest. How many of you would think that was an elephant? Um, and then there are rumbles. I don't know if the speaker will play this. I will try. It. It's a very low frequency rumble, yeah? Um, and what Smitha found was that these are used in very different contexts. So just for fun, if you don't mind, Shiva, I will just play a few videos. So here are some of them. Uh, trumpet. This is a wild dog. The wild dogs which are bothering an elephant. Using it to chase the wild dogs away. Typically, the roars are only made between members of the same species. You will hear a roar. You see. Yeah, that one turned back and sort of. You hear it in aggressive interactions within the herd. This one. Uh, did I lose the chips? Ah. Rumble. Rumble is long distance contact calling. You may or may not hear this one actually. But, uh, oh, you can. So one uh, of member of the herd was separated from the rest and was quite far away. And these two were contact calling at that point. And finally, we were very lucky to witness some weird things like elephants chasing bears. And so there's a bear up here in a tree. The elephants are milling around. And if I can find the bear. We were a bit scared because we didn't want to go anywhere near. But um, Can you hear those sounds? Those are the chirps. They make them when they are confused and alarmed. And the bear is up in the tree here, okay? So there was a lot of confusion at that time. The bear ran up into the tree, the elephants were milling around, and then they were making all of these chirps. They make them when they are you know, sort of confusion. All right, I'm gonna end here. So I hope I gave you some glimpse of what it takes to study animal acoustic signaling. It takes a lot of patience, piles and piles and piles of patience because animals will do whatever they want and there's nothing you can do about it, yeah? So uh, if you're working out in the field, it takes a lot of courage because you're working 
in areas where you have full control, where you have snakes, where you have wild animals, where you have not so nice people sometimes, so it takes a lot of courage. And determination and persistence because it takes a long time to actually get data in the middle of all of this. And you can only do all of that if you have a huge amount of passion um, and you really love doing this kind of thing. So I'll end again by acknowledging all these wonderful people who have worked with me over the years. I hope you had fun. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>
here we have only considered uh, crickets right but they can also hear other species that uh, you know, use the same frequency. So doesn't that add to the problem? Yes. Um, other uh, creatures or other insects? So there's two sides to this. So I separated it between interspecific and in, but my very first piece is actually individuals singing at exactly the same frequency. And they have ways to solve that problem, both physiological and ecological. I can talk to you in detail about it. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? So I'm around for the interactions after 6 o'clock, and I'm around for dinner. So please, at any time, feel free to come and ask me anything. But, but anyone else? I should probably stop. If not, we'll thank Ruth.